God, thank you so much for those truths. God, it is a privilege to come and worship you in spirit and in truth, that we have your word to inform our minds. You have given us emotions to fill our hearts. You have given uh, so much truth, God, even salvation, to turn our affections, our minds to you. And God, I pray as we continue to worship together that your word would move us, God, to trust you more, to love you better, to love one another, and to practice obedience to a greater degree than we currently do, God. And we trust that you will accomplish these things in us according to your will. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30 is where we will be this morning. And as you're turning there, I want you to listen to the following list of names. These are names of people, groups, movements, and see if you can recognize any of these. Jacob spoke about one during communion, the Sadducees. How about Faustus and the Manichees? Saturninus, Marcion and his followers, the Marcionites. What about the Sardonians? The Severians, the Albigenses, the Ptolemaeans, the Nicolaitans, the Gnostics, Porphyry, the Valentinians, the Elogians, not theologians, the Elogians. How about the Ebionites or Roman Catholicism, Mormonism? Maybe you didn't recognize any or many of these maybe only a few ring, ring a bell. Whether you realize it or not, all of these groups have one thing in common. Some groups such as the Sadducees and the Nicolaitans we recognize from the witness of the New Testament. The Sadducees being that group that appears in the gospel accounts who were consistently quarreling with and testing Jesus. They denied as Jacob explained basic Old Testament doctrines and eventually participated with other leaders of the Jews in putting Jesus to death. And the Nicolaitans are mentioned in Revelation 2.6, where the Apostle John commends the church at Ephesus for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Other groups like the Gnostics aren't specifically named in the New Testament, but may be referenced in a couple of New Testament books. Errors like the ones for which they eventually became well-known infiltrated the church even while the apostles were still alive and writing scripture. And others that I just named appear at various times throughout church history and were refuted by godly men like Augustine and Tertullian and Irenaeus, faithful men who held the line for truth. And some that you heard are more recognizable because they're more recent. All of these groups have one thing in common, and it's this. Each man or group denied portions of Scripture or added other books to the books of the Bible or both. Each of these groups, each of these people was or is a part of a movement that disobeyed the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. And because they disobeyed this passage and others like it, they missed the blessing that the passage offers, that this passage promises. The same disobedience that these people practice, the same blessing that they missed, we are not immune to as believers, as we'll discover shortly. We can make similar or the same mistakes that they made, 
And so we need this passage in Proverbs 30 to fortify our thinking about the nature of God's word and to renew our commitment to it. So let's look at the passage together. We'll be in verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. It's a simple passage, few words, straightforward, unambiguous, not confusing. And in a matter of only a few words, this passage makes a grand, lofty claim about the Word of God. And this claim that it makes about God's words demands that we respond in specific ways. Here's what we'll glean from this passage this morning. We'll have it all up for you on the outline first. What we'll see in this passage is that the flawless purity of God's words demands two responses from us. The flawless purity of God's word demands two responses from us. We must, one, take refuge in God, and we must, two, take God at his word. We must take refuge in God and take God at his word. Look at verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Or if you're looking at the NASB, every word of God is tested. The New American Standard Bible uses that word tested instead of proves true. These two translations are actually helpful. They aren't competing with one another. Both good translations. But the claim that all God's words possess flawless purity is what this passage is communicating. Every one of God's words possesses flawless purity, absolute perfection that is free from any error whatsoever. The difference in the way this gets translated in these two English versions of the Bible is actually helpful because together the two translations capture the full picture of what's going on in the original. To test something was a term used in smithing, smithing. A smith was someone who would melt and mold metals for various uses. And in particular, a silversmith tests metals. Oftentimes in this process of testing metals, what a silversmith is doing is separating what is impure away from whatever precious metal might be attached to or mixed with what isn't valuable. If gold is dug out of some cavern in the side of a mountain somewhere, then it's a smith's job to separate what's actually gold from what is worthless sediment. So this process of separation would involve intense heat applied to the metal because the metal can withstand the heat. And whatever was worthless, the worthless stuff would get incinerated in the fire And in this process, the only thing left behind would be those precious, valuable metals that the smith was after. These would withstand fire. And so in the New American Standard Bible, tests is an accurate translation describing the process. The ESV, though, uses the word proves true. Every word of God proves true because this captures the sense of the process of what's going on. This process was always undertaken to get what was best out of the metal, to to end up with on the other side of the process, once the process was complete, a pure metal free from anything worthless or anything impure. So the idea is that God's word demonstrates its own purity whenever it encounters heat. In other words, 
every one of God's words can withstand whatever heat or scrutiny it undergoes. Every one of God's words withstands whatever scrutiny it undergoes. You can scrutinize the historical claims of Scripture, and God's words will prove true. You can scrutinize the scientific claims of God's words, and they will prove true. You can scrutinize the consistency of God's words within a single book, across both testaments, and they will prove true 100% of the time. You can assess the moral uprightness of God's words, and every time God's words will prove true. Any test that God's words could possibly undergo will only reveal that those words possess flawless purity from the onset. From the very beginning, they were pure. The words that entered into this scrutiny will be the same things, the same words that come out of the scrutiny. What goes in passes the test. Every word of God proves true. Now, notice what it doesn't say in verse 5. What's proven true? Not some, not most, not almost every word. No, every single word proves true. And that is every single word proves true. Every book of the Bible is not what God has in view for us here. Every chapter is not what is spoken of. Not every paragraph and not even every sentence. But at the very level of the words themselves, every single word is proven true in God's word. It doesn't even say every doctrine proves true or every systematic articulation of truth proves true. Why? It doesn't say any of those things because what God is drawing our attention to in this passage is his trustworthiness at the word level. God wants us to know that we can rely on every single one of his words. We can trust God down to the very word that he has spoken. That is encouraging. That is a rock to stand on. Every single word. If you've ever wondered why we preach so slowly through entire books of the Bible at Grace Bible Church, that's called expository or expositional preaching, this explains it. Why we don't jump from topic to topic or catchy series to catchy series. We want to get our eyes and our hearts on every single word that God has spoken. We want to saturate our hearts and our minds in every single word that God spoke to us for our good and for his glory. Every word ought to matter to us. Every word of God ought to matter to us corporately as well as personally. So it should also matter to us in our personal Bible intake as well. Every single word should matter. That means don't abandon your reading plan at Leviticus. Don't skip the genealogies or the introductions of books. Don't check your brain at the doxologies at the end of books. Every single word matters. And so when you encounter difficulty in coming to God's word, as we all do at times, because we are not perfect yet, some portions of God's word seem less interesting to us. That's not God's word's fault. That's only our hearts deceiving us. And so because of the truth of passages like this one that we're looking at, we can remind ourselves in those times when it's hard to press on in Bible intake in whatever form you are taking in God's word, we can remind ourselves 
that every word of God proves true. Every word of God is intended for our good, even if in the moment we don't understand how. We can humbly press forward in God's words wherever we find ourselves. And so because of that initial statement in verse 5, every word of God proves true, the passage that the rest of the passage is telling us how we ought to respond to these flawlessly pure words. So our first point, our response to the flawless purity of God's word must be first, we must take refuge in God. We must take refuge in God. A refuge is a, a shelter, biblically, that someone would run to from a variety of things, from weather, from enemies hunting their lives. They even had in Israel cities of refuge where someone who took someone else's life accidentally could flee to for safety. And so here, the second line in verse 5 says, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him, who take refuge in him. God's often called a refuge in Scripture. He is where the believer can find safety from all kinds of danger. And this says that for those who take refuge in God, God acts like something that protects, a shield. God is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He provides the protection that the one who fled to him for refuge sought. But how is this done that can seem very abstract? Take refuge in God. Okay, what does that mean? How do I do that practically? How are we supposed to take refuge in God so that he becomes a shield for our protection? And this is where it's so helpful that God hasn't left us to our own thinking. You have to flee to me for refuge. Now go figure out how to do that. But the passage actually gives us instruction, it implies how this is to be done. Look at the first line again. Every word of God proves true. What's in view there? God's word. Verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. In verse 6, the same thing is in view as in verse 5, God's words. So there in the second line in verse 5, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. It shouldn't be a mystery to us what the author is pointing us to, how this is done. He's still talking about God's word. The implication here is that taking refuge in God is a matter of trusting his word. How do we flee to God for protection? Trust his word. Trust that, believe that every word proves true. In doing that, we, believer, are protected. Have you taken refuge in God? Have you forsaken your own wisdom and intelligence in favor of God's wisdom that he has communicated to us in his word? That is how we practically take refuge in God. Proverbs 3, 5 tells us, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You can only do one of those at any given time. Trust Yahweh with all your heart or lean on your own understanding. And only, there's only protection in one of those, and that's trusting in the Lord rather than your own understanding. Specifically, trusting in the Lord as he has revealed himself in Scripture. Have you taken refuge in God even by fleeing to Christ to be saved from the wrath of God that you deserve? That's the gospel. You must flee to God by believing what he has said about Jesus and how you can be saved from his wrath. Children in the room who have heard the gospel from a young age, probably your entire life, you are not safe because of the family that you are in. You must flee to God by believing what he has said in his word about you, 
about your sin, about what all sinners deserve on your own accord. And there is great protection for you should you do that. There is nothing in God to deter us from fleeing to him as a refuge and taking him at his word. Only encouragement, great encouragement to do that. He promises to be a shield for you, for all who take refuge in him. Christian, where do you run when you need rest, protection, comfort? When you're confronted by your own dangerous doubt, awful anxiety, foolish fears, where do you turn? In those moments, we need to look, we must look, no other place than our Bibles. If you look to a person, let it be because you know they're going to tell you what God says. God has spoken the perfect words to cure our souls of doubt, anxiety, fear, and whatever else grips our hearts. And we must run to his word for whatever comfort we seek. That is the only place to find true safety. That is what it means that God is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Take refuge in God by trusting God, taking him at his word. And that's the second thing that this passage requires of us, encourages us toward. Not only to take refuge in God, but simply to take God at his word. We must take refuge in God and take God at his word, all because God's word is perfectly pure. This has been uh, clearly stated from the very beginning of the book of Proverbs, to just take God at his word, to simply take him at his word, In chapter 1 in Proverbs, we see wisdom crying aloud in the streets. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. From the very beginning of the book, wisdom is pleading with sinners, pleading with people who are hopelessly enslaved to their foolishness to listen, to be heard. In chapter 2, Solomon says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God because Yahweh gives wisdom from his mouth, his words, Come knowledge and understanding, chapter 2, verse 6. All of those statements begin with, if you receive my words, not come to it with an agenda and listen until you hear something you disagree with, you don't like. Listen for it to find out what's right about them and then discern what's wrong about them. A fool can't discern what's wrong. And certainly when it comes to God's word, there's no cause for hesitation in accepting them all. And so the second thing that this passage in Proverbs 30 points us to is simply taking God at his word. Verse 6 says, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. If every one of the words that God has spoken proves true, then it makes sense why we shouldn't add our words to it. Our words would ruin the flawless purity of God's words. If you've ever been wrong about anything at all, ever, which we all have, then you can't trust yourself. If you've ever erred in your reasoning in your knowledge, then you are disqualified from absolute trust. We are no longer worthy of those things. Our wisdom, our knowledge, our insight is faulty. This is why Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. 
Instead of being wise in your own eyes, it says, fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. You can't be wise so long as you're thinking that you're the solution to the problem of foolishness in the world. Not everybody else's, not your own. We should abandon our thoughts and instead acknowledge God as the only wise God. Paul calls God that at the end of Romans, chapter 16, verse 27, to the only wise God be glory forevermore. This prohibition of adding anything to God's words <clears throat> in the Hebrew canon, Proverbs is a part of a, one of three sections called the writings. And so this would have, and not in our Bibles, in our Bibles it appears at the middle, even the middle of the Old Testament. In the Hebrew canon, it would have been at the end, the last section of the, of the Jewish Bible. But this wasn't the first time at the end of God's word in the Old Testament that this was said. Turn back to, to Deuteronomy. This same prohibition was given by Moses in the first section of the Hebrew canon. And more than once, as we'll see. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, <clears throat> Moses is preparing to send the people under Joshua's leadership into the promised land. Finally, now that the first rebellious generation has been done away with, this is his swan song, so to speak. He's going to die. Nations going with Joshua to drive out all of the people who are in the promised land. And listen at his instructions. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, the Lord, your God, which I command you. Notice that when Moses commands the people not to add to this word, whose command does he actually say it is first? Do you see it in verse 2? You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you. That is Moses. Nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you. It's Moses' commandments, Yahweh's commandments, Moses' commandments. Whose commandments is it? It's both. Moses spoke God's very words. This is helpful for us as we think about what to do with our Bibles. We should never separate the human author's intention from the divine author's intention. It is both God's word and man's word as the Holy Spirit moved on those men to cause them to write God's very words. Every one of them being breathed out by God, as 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us. So this is an injunction not to add to or take away from anything that God gave to Israel through Moses. Fast forward to chapter 12. He repeats this. You would think it was important to Moses or something that they not do this. Chapter 12, verse 32. Whatever I command you, whatever I command you, all that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. Again, same instructions. Don't alter God's words in any way. Not only is it disobedient to add or take away from God's words, but it also prevents the person doing that from obeying God because they've ruined his perfect words that they were supposed to obey by adding or taking away from it. 
It is disobedience, and it prevents obedience any further. Each of the rebellious men and religious movements that we mentioned earlier violated these passages of Scripture. They failed at this very point. They tampered with the flawless word of God. The Sadducees only held to the five books of Moses and discarded the rest of the Old Testament, while the Ptolemaeans denied that Pentateuch was even Scripture at all. One group embraced only the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. The other group rejected that they were Scripture at all and denied the re- and embraced the rest. Faustus, the Manichees, Saturninus, Marcion, the Sidonians, Severians, and the Albigenses, they all rejected the entire Old Testament for various reasons and only accepted the new. The Nicolaitans and the Gnostics removed the book of Psalms from the canon of Scripture. Porphyry, a third century philosopher, denied the book of Daniel as being inspired. The Valentinians rejected all of the gospel accounts except the book of John, while the Elogians rejected all the writings of John. The Ebionites accepted Matthew as the only inspired gospel and condemned Paul as a heretic. Not sure how you do that. The Severians denied that Acts was an inspired book of the Bible. Roman Catholicism includes uninspired apocrypha writings within its canon of Scripture, and Mormons attempt to add the Book of Mormon as well as their doctrines and covenants as writings on par with Scripture. You get the idea that this has been happening for a very long time. This is not new. By the way, the only reason we know of any of these names is because they're recent, Mormonism, or they've stuck around a a really long time, (laughs) Roman Catholicism, or in most cases, the only reason we know about heretics that once existed is because men who wrote and defended the truth tells us what they're writing against. (laughs) Think about that. We wouldn't know who most of these people and groups were unless those who were defending the truth actually told us about their error. That proves the point of Proverbs 30, verse 6. The point that it makes is that once you start tampering with the word of God, you'll be proven a liar. As with almost all of these errors that we just named, this has been fulfilled in them. They have been lost and forgotten in the dense annals of history, and when the remembrance of them is periodically resurrected, their names are inseparable from the shameful stain of fraud, deceiver, liar. If you don't want to be remembered as a liar in history, don't mess with God's word. In Proverbs 30, the passage, verses 5 and 6, the passage that we're looking at, there's a play on ideas going on here at the beginning and end. In English, we we rhyme the sounds of words. In Hebrew, they rhyme ideas by comparison or contrast. Look again at verse 5. Every word of God proves true. And then the first line in verse Uh, or the last line in verse 6, lest he rebuke you and you be found or approved a liar. The play on ideas going on there is God, when he is tested, proves true. People who tamper with God's words and alter God's words, when they are tested, they're proven false, proven liars, untrustworthy. Now, chances are you have never considered cutting out a section of your Bible or adding other books that you like between Revelation and the back cover. If you have, see one of the elders. We'd love to help you (laughs) with that. (laughs) But as I said earlier, we're not immune to this error. 
Think about all the ways that we're prone to make similar mistakes. For example, have you ever thought to yourself, ah, that passage, that's too difficult. Why does it have to be in my Bible? It's rubbing me the wrong way. Or, man, that is so hard to understand. Why couldn't God have just said it like, there's an assumption there that you could actually say it better or you know a better way to say it. That's a denial that every word of God is flawless already, perfect as is, can't be improved upon, right? Or have you ever said, or maybe you've heard it said, God told me to take this job, buy this car, date this person. Or what this passage means to me is, or I feel like God is telling me to, all of those are examples, subtle, you might not, that might not make you a Marcionite heretic, but those are subtle examples of adding to, taking away from, tampering in some way with God's words. We have to guard our hearts from doing that. Are there any commands of scripture that you have been unwilling to obey? Anything that God requires of you that you've tried to convince yourself that doesn't apply to me for these reasons. Or that doesn't mean like what it sounds like it's saying for these reasons. That's just a, a subtle way of removing God's words. If you don't have the meaning of scripture, you don't have the scriptures. If you change the meaning of scriptures, you've changed the scriptures. So we must be careful in doing these things. In a practical sense, in a practical sense, we also take away from God's word when we just ignore portions of it. When we treat certain parts of the Bible like they're not worth reading, not worth believing, not a big deal. How often have you heard we don't need to divide over that. We don't need to focus on that doctrine. We don't need to focus on that passage. That's a hard passage. That's a debated passage. We don't need to give that any attention. That's not upholding the truth of this passage. And practically, we add to God's words when we long for other books and writings in the way that we should thirst for Scripture alone. What's the difference between a person who uh, intentionally adds extra revelation to the Bible and someone who just treats other books with the regard that they should treat Scripture with? There are differences for sure, but it's another practical way of violating this passage. What is your reading, what is your desire for reading news updates say about where you believe God is speaking, for example? What does your social media intake reveal you think about where God's priority is, where God's voice is? today in the world. We shouldn't treat other things with the regard that we should have for the scriptures. And so there are many subtle ways that our hearts can make these mistakes and we should just guard from them. Again, because he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. There's protection in guarding our heart in these ways. Just think about redemptive history having proved this truth time and time again. How often has every word of God been proven true? How often has it been tested 
and demonstrated that it was trustworthy. When God told Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, God's word was tested and proved true. When God said that he would flood the earth, God's word was tested and it was proved true. When God told Abraham that he would have a son and he would become a multitude of descendants, even then God's word was tested and proved true against all odds. When God said that he would rescue Abraham's descendants, Israel, from Egypt, God's word was tested and tested and tested and tested, and it eventually was proved true. He rescued his people from Egypt. When God promised the people that he would give them the promised land and drive out nations before them, God's word was tested and God's word was proved true. When God told the people that he would remove them from the land because of their disobedience, God's word was tested and it was proved true. When God said over and over and over again that he would send his son, Israel's king, born of a virgin, even, that was tested and it was proved true. When God tells us all throughout the Old Testament that Jesus would suffer and die under the wrath of God for sin, that was tested and it was proved true. When God said that he would raise up his son from the dead, it was tested and it was proved true against all odds. When God tells us that Jesus will return to rescue the church, that word is being tested. It will be proved true. When God says that Jesus will then pour out wrath on this world in a way never before seen, that word is being tested and it will be proven true. And when God tells us that Jesus will then come and reign as king in the temple, as king in the temple, as priest for a thousand years, that will be tested and it will prove itself true. And when God describes what will happen to this world when he burns it up and establishes a new heavens and a new earth, that word will be tested and it will be proven true. God is a refuge, a shield to all those who take refuge in him. And so we should regard the word of God in that way. Thomas Watson in The Godly Man's Picture says this, let us test by this characteristic whether we are godly. Are we lovers of the word? Grace Bible Church, we must be lovers of the word for God's sake, for our sake, and for the sake of, of this church. God, thank you so much for your flawless words. No one was in any position to tell you that you must speak to us, and yet you have done so. 66 books worth of words to comfort our souls. Your word tells us that when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. And God, I pray for the men and women who are part of Grace Bible Church, the children who are here at Grace Bible Church, God, that we would wisely flee to you for refuge and that we would find you to be a shield to us because your words are true, every one of them. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.